Okay, very excited that we have Robbie Ferguson, uh, co-founder of Immutable here. Uh, Robbie was OG in the space, God's Unchained. Very excited you're here. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. Good morning, everyone. I'll try and wake us up a bit. Uh, so today I was asked to give a talk on scaling NFT gaming companies. And while there's nothing inherently different about scaling a gaming company or an NFT company compared to anything else, I wanted to give some unique insights into how we've done it at Immutable, how we would do things differently if we could go back in time, and also how I think the future of Web3 in particular can impact org design and the way that companies scale through features such as DAOs. Uh, over the past couple of weeks, we've seen everything from uh, governance be lauded as the future of how companies uh, will work to having some serious issues with it. So we'll go into all of these things in a pretty brief time today. Uh, so quick, a bit of background. Uh, Immutable is a layer two platform powering the next generation of Web3 games. We power some of the biggest games uh, on the blockchain in the world today. Everyone from Alluvium to Embersword to Congregate to marketplaces like GameStop and Rarible to Gods Unchained and, and Guild of Guardians, our internal content. And our goal really is we think the next billion players or billion users of Web3 are going to come from games where players under the hood don't even know the technology that they're using. All they're doing is experiencing the benefits. But in order to get to where we are today, we had to go through some shit. So I want to talk you through the structures and, and techniques that we use to approach that uh, and how we now think about it as a company. One of the favorite metaphors that I have for scaling a company uh, was the one applied to Uber, uh, which is pirate to Navy. And the reason they use this metaphor is because in the early days of your company's growth, all that matters is a sense of urgency, empowerment, and autonomy that allows everyone to go and do the job they need to do at the fastest pace possible. You need to be pirates who are you know, claiming land and building as quickly as possible without thinking about uh, risk in an overly restrictive manner. As the company gets larger, you have real risks and assets and things to think about. You need to become a navy. You need to establish structure and make sure that the risks that you built out by achieving so much growth in the first few years of the company are now catered for in the company's structure. Uh, and the trick is allowing yourself to actually fix things later on while solving for the problems that you have at the right time. And so the two overriding uh, notions that I'll talk about today is how can you build leverage in your company and how can you build culture in your company? And without leverage or culture, you will not be able to achieve or scale the things that you want to be able to achieve. And leverage quite simply comes down to how is your time spent in the most effective way possible? At what stage of the company are you doing what kind of activity? Working on smart contracts or editing user designs might be the best thing for you to do when you're under 10 people. It is a pretty big waste of time if you're 300. And so you constantly have to have an idea of what is the most impactful way you can spend your time at that company. And the second thing is culture. And no matter whether you're zero to 10 people, 10 to 100 people or more than a thousand people as a company, this is always the most important thing you build in a company. Because no matter what product you work on, no matter what pivots you have to make, the most important thing is what is the culture of the team that you are building. Uh, and let me tell you, once you hit about 30 people, this is fixed. This is the culture that you have built from your foundation up. And from then on, it's how do you cultivate and improve that as you scale. So let's start out. Uh, zero to 10 people, or what I like to call the stage of absolute lunacy. Your job is to do whatever it takes to make your company successful. Your problems, if you are dealing with the right ones, is to find product market fit. And unhealthy problems at this stage is culture and hiring. If you have a bad culture or bad hires in the first 10 people, you should stop what you're doing and start again. And what you're spending your time on is literally anything. You are programming, you are designing, you are customer support, you are doing every single role that the company requires of you. So we started out in December 2017 by building the first ever multiplayer game on a blockchain called Etherbots. Uh, it was completely decentralized and on-chain. Uh, we, we learned a lot about what should be on-chain versus off-chain pretty early on. And right now, if you play a round of this game, it'll cost you $6,000 in gas fees. Um, so I don't necessarily recommend it. Uh, but what the beautiful thing about this stage is, is that everyone works together automatically. There is no need for meetings. There is no need for formal structures. Uh, the engineers are the product designers and the product managers. So you have an incredible efficiency. And this is the stage where you can really develop the bones of an exceptional product or exceptional product market fit. 
enjoy this stage because the benefits you get here in terms of being able to work with each other ridiculously easily will never exist again. Uh, and so we literally started out with three people who were doing everything from the contract design to the game itself. And you must obsess about culture at this stage. So from the very beginning, our values have been incredibly important to us. Uh, we have four of them, and they've all come from different things that happened at the company. Uh, we learned pretty early on the most important thing in building a successful product is to tell the truth always and to be as direct as possible. But if everyone is always being as blunt as possible, you end up a with a company where no one likes each other. So we, we refined this into lovingly speak our minds. Um, and this has been really crucial, I think, to, to the company even today. Uh, the second thing is that you must learn ridiculously quickly. We are doing a category creating exercise, whether you're working in Web3 in gaming or in DeFi or in any application of NFTs, we are doing things that have not been done before, both on a market perspective and on a technical perspective. And so the most important thing is how do we learn and adapt to changes in the industry, to what customers want. And so this leads into our value of we live to level up. Our third thing is we take ownership. Uh, when I was first starting the company, we talked to an investor in very early 2018 while we were doing our, our seed rounds. And he said, I love what you're building, uh, which was when we started out a, a trading card game that used NFTs to empower people to trade their games inside a digital context with the same benefit you have from playing Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering as a kid. And this investor said to us, love what you're doing, but one of my portfolio companies is already doing it. They're much faster than you. They were back six months ago, and they're going to go to market in 12 weeks. And so we said, thank you very much for the information. Uh, we went home, and we basically did 110 hour weeks and didn't sleep for eight weeks until we had shipped the first iteration of God's Unchained. And our competitor never launched. So one of the most important things early on is a sense of urgency. How can you ship the fastest? How can you be first? Which enables you to have the learnings to get to the next stage. The next stage of company is 10 to 50 people. At this stage, your job is process, structure, and establishing the machine that will be the backbone of the next thousand people that you hire. The healthy problems that you should be dealing with is your revenue maturity and scaling your company. Your unhealthy problems should be product market fit. If you're 50 people and you haven't found product market fit, you should think about staying at that size until you have it. And what you'll spend your time on is all management and hiring, and you will be doing a lot of it. By this time, we were scaling out a game, God's Unchained, which we'd made multiple eight figures in revenue. We had hired our first proper industry executives, uh, like Chris Clay, who ran Magic the Gathering Arena. And we had also done the first meetings. Uh, I think it was literally, in, we had 11 people before one of our hires said it and, and came in and said, we should have a leadership meeting on a regular basis um, and start working out how we should be running this company. So there's a lot of things that you take for granted at larger companies that while you're building a smaller one, you simply don't think about. Um, finally, we hit this, this stage of where we're at today, which is 300 people. Um, and from the 50 to 350 people stage, your job at the company is entirely different. Your job is scale and culture. And culture is the number one lever you have in growing a successful organization beyond this stage. Your product will be roughly well-defined. You will have an idea of the organizational design and the structures that you want to be growing with. The most important thing is how do people identify with the mission? And every day, know that the work that they are working on is incredibly important to, you know, for Immutable, empowering the next billion users of Web3 to truly own in-game objects via NFTs. The healthy problems you should be working on is scaling. And the unhealthy problems, if at this point you're still working on product market fit, you should seriously consider uh, rethinking the way that you've built your company. And what you will spend your time on is hiring executives, culture, and strategy. So when we hit the stage of 150 people, um, it was just over a year ago. We're now 300, so we've doubled in a pretty short pace of time. And we were going through a lot of changes as a company. One, we had built two games internally. Two, we had built the first zero-knowledge roll-up platform for NFTs to scale them. Uh, and three, we were going through this process of how could we scale all of this while still maintaining our culture in both sides of the business. And so a lot of that success came down to hiring the right leadership. Uh, you know, Justin Hulog, who we hired from Riot Games, uh, who, who ran uh, Asia for that market, was incredible in coming in on the game side. Um, we hired awesome executives to the platform side. And the time invested in this is the most important time you can spend as a founder at this stage. Because they will be the people who make scaling decisions that provide the leverage for hundreds of people onboarding onto the company after that. 
I finally wanted to touch on how does scale in Web3 or NFT gaming companies look like beyond uh, uh, sort of 350 people? And I know I'm nearly out of time, but I think we've seen a lot of really interesting things happen with DAOs. They're definitely not ready to support a company of thousands today. In fact, the largest DAOs in the world have not reached beyond this point of 350 people. And we've seen in recent weeks things like Solend, uh, basically voting to steal their users' funds, uh, or another game voting to illegally return a seed investor's money because they did not think it provided enough value for them. So the governance proposals that have been made through the structure of DAOs today have not been proven to work at these hundreds of people. But I think there's a lot of hope because the fundamental problems that 1,000 or 10,000 or 100,000 person organizations face today can be solved through DAOs and Web3. If you look at the politics of Facebook or you look at the revenue incentives of these companies as they become value extractive, the most important thing is how can you decentralize fees? How can you have social policy which is run by people? The least important thing is how can you have effective, quick decision making? So I think that when you look at the possibilities of governance and DAOs, it'll actually play an increasing role over the next century as we become more efficient at structuring the way that companies are created. Um, so hopefully some useful insights on, on how we've scaled Immutable. Uh, it's not too different to how most Web2 technology companies have scaled, but I think we've done it with the backbone of something that can progressively decentralize uh, and have a really, really important future where the fees or, or the governance decisions we make in two, three, four or five years can be run by the community. Thank you Thanks. so much, Robbie. Awesome. Thank you, thank you.